next speakers are Brianna Donaldson and Dave Kung, and they are going to speak about symmetry and group theory in box canons. Take it away. Thanks very much. Um, we, we thought uh, we should start with some music. So we're, we're going to play you something. And uh, please, uh, enjoy and listen carefully while you're reading this lovely quote. <laughs> Sorry, David. Sorry, David. We'll start over. We'll start over. Not totally. Okay, right. Here we go. Please enjoy it this time. We'll come back to that piece at the end, and I think you will hear it in a completely different way. Uh, we're going to talk about some transformations. We need to make sure we, under, we are all on the same page. Some of this is, uh, is, is mathematics that many of you know very well. We want to make sure you understand the musical part as well. So, musical mathematical transformations? Right, so um, when we're talking about mathematical transformations, we could talk about reflections, for example. Um, so today we'll be um, talking about sort of the musical equivalent of reflecting about the x-axis or and also reflecting about the y-axis. Um, and another important uh, transformation that we'll be talking about today is uh, translations, so basically shifting um, something in a particular direction or in a particular way. So all of this like follows under the mathematical uh, theory of group theory, um, which many of us know well. And groups of numbers are the most familiar. We have integers. Uh, thinking of this with addition, um, let's all make sure we're all awake. One plus one would give you one plus three. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for reading and not listening. Um, we could also do the integers mod two, and so we have odds and evens, and we're thinking of all of the odds and all of the evens, and if you take odds plus evens, you get? Ah, oh, thank you very much. You're, you're doing very well. Um, and so if we, if we move over to, uh, to sort of uh, to transformations in terms of translation, we can think of going up one unit and, uh, or two units or down one or two units, um, and we can do very similar things. If you go up one unit and then three units, you have gone up four units, thank you. Um, and this gives you the same structure as the integers. Uh, we can also do reflections, and here we reflect over the x-axis twice, and that gets us back to the identity. And we see that that is the same structure as, uh, as, as z2, right, with the odds and evens. If we do multiple reflections, we get something that, uh, that many of us know and love, the Klein-4 group, which is z2 cross z2. Um, the fun part about this is that we can do all of this in a musical setting. Uh, now, what I love about this is that, you know, group theory, you think of these luminaries in group theory, born in the 1700s, and, and Emmy Noether there in 1882, uh, composers were using very similar ideas to this long before this, right? And so somehow the, the music, like, it predicts the mathematics, which is wonderful. It is wonderful, yeah. yeah. So um, we're going to give you some examples of this. Would you like to, you want to play these on the Yeah, screen? sure. All right. So um, let's start with a, a melody here. Um, and this is just like the identity transformation of the melody. This is the melody itself. Okay, and then this is an inversion of that melody. So this is basically like reflecting about the x axis. Oh, sorry, other way, x axis. So basically, where um, you could hear the pitch descending before, now you're going to hear it ascending instead. And I can't really, not really, but <laughs> <laughs> I think I have, well, let's see. So then um, we have retrograde, which is basically uh, like flipping about the y-axis. It's like backwards, 
version of the original. Or we could also combine uh, retrograde inversions, so both sort of uh, flipping about y axis, uh, x axis and y axis at the same time, which sounds like this. That bass line is actually from something very famous, um, and uh, Brianna's going to tell us where this is from. Right. Thanks, Dave. So the bass line, or that melody, is actually a bass line from uh, the Goldberg Variations by J.S. Bach. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Goldberg Variations, uh, they're considered one of the great masterpieces of classical music. Uh, they take about uh, 80 minutes to perform. Are you ready? <laughs> just, just, just kidding, just kidding. Um, but so uh, basically, uh, they're really a monumental achievement that kind of encapsulates really kind of all of Baroque music in some way. It's like a microcosm of like, it's everything that was sort of known in the musical world and classical music at the time. Uh, and it's basically, and the structure, for our purposes today, I'll say just a couple words about the structure of it, which incorporates all kinds of symmetry. So it starts out with a theme that's 32 measures long, an aria, um, and then there are 30 variations or, on the theme, so 30 different sort of treatments of the theme, and then the aria repeats. So the theme is 32 measures long. There are also 32 sections to the piece. Um, and uh, the variations have an interesting structure as well. So there, there are 30 variations. They're in groups of three. Uh, so uh, basically, in each group of three, there's one uh, sort of movement or variation that's um, kind of a dance-like, usually dance-like, or other kind of genre piece in a way. Uh, and then there's one that's just very virtuosic. It's showing off all the kinds of things you could do on the keyboard instruments of the day, including some cool things that you couldn't, you can't really do on pianos very easily today. But anyway, that's it for another talk. Um, and then uh, the third piece in those little groups was a canon. So there, as I said, there are actually 10 canons throughout the Goldberg Variations. And so a canon is basically a melody plus um, a transformation of the melody, one or more transformations of that melody um, kind of juxtaposed in different ways which is going to be what we're going to talk about a little bit more now. Although maybe I should play uh, the opening. It would be great. Okay. Especially, uh, we want you to listen to the left hand, the lower part of this, which is the melody that you just heard. Okay. So I'm actually going to listen to, or I'm going to play through this twice. So the first time I'll play the sort of original, just the first eight bars uh, from the aria of the Goldberg Variations. And then I'll play it again a second time. And the second time especially, uh, hopefully you'll be able to hear um, you know, this melody that we're going to explore a little bit more. So that's the original, and then, oh, thank you. Again, beautiful. Thank you. Brianna, j could you just isolate the left hand there? Absolutely. Play it a little faster, maybe? So Bach wrote that as part of the Goldberg Variations. And then Bach, as a separate exercise, took this aside and, and turned it into 14 different canons. Um, and it's a, it's a piece that's now called the 14 Canons on the Goldberg Ground. Um, there's just some amazing things about this piece. Among other things, uh, it was not discovered until the 1970s. 
many years after, uh, long after Bach is gone. We know it was actually Bach because it was found in a copy that can be traced back. So we know it was there. It also is connected to the Goldberg. Um, Goldberg variations there. Uh, this is it. Uh, it's about six minutes of music, but it's a single sheet of music. And, and the way you get six minutes of music out of a single sheet is kind of ingenious and highly mathematical. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk with you about today. So uh, we're not gonna play all, um, all of these 14. We're gonna focus on the first three and then we're gonna jump a little bit later. Um, each one of these is written in a seemingly very simple way. Here's, I, I love thinking about this. This is Bach's original handwriting, right? Um, we've cleaned it up so that you can see it. Uh, and, and one of the oddities here you notice is that there's, this, the, you know, there's a, a clef on the left side, but then there's also this clef on the right side, um, and you notice that it's backwards. Um, and this is sort of your clue. It's a little bit of a puzzle, and this particular puzzle is indicating that this isn't a solo, this is a duet, but one person has to play it backwards. And if you write it out, it sounds like this. And I'll take the top line? Sure, I'll play the backwards part. All right, here we go. I'll just, here's the top line. Somehow it becomes a beautiful duet, even mm -hmm. though it's just one part there. And the way you get that is through these transformations. Here's canon two. Again, you have a, a, an additional clef on the right side, and so it's backwards. Um, here they are written out. And again, it's a beautiful duet, isn't it? It is, it very is nice. pretty. Um, here's, the, here's the third canon, uh, and, and this one has, introduces another little bit. So first of all, um, there's an inversion. The only reason you know it's an inversion is because in that particular clef, that has to be an F sharp. The only read that, way to read that as an F sharp is to invert. And then there's an additional part to this. There's a, a little sig a, a symbol there. We call it a del segno uh, in music. Um, and that's indicating something. You have to figure this out. Like Bach didn't tell you, but the clue there is that uh, one of the parts has to start a little bit later. Aren't those lovely little pieces? <laughs> We're gonna jump to the 14th canon. They're all wonderful, and you should look, out, look into these. Um, to understand the 14th canon, you have to understand uh, two more transformations. They're fairly simple. It's augmentation and diminution. This is just stretching and shrinking. So, you know, stretching. Playing it long or playing it faster, right? Those are sort of easier in, uh, transformations in time. And when you come, you need these in to, uh, to get the 14th canon. Here's the original Bach uh, of the 14th canon, and it's particularly, uh, it's particularly tricky in that what he writes on top is, it's a canon in four parts with augmentation and diminution. That's it, that's all you get. Uh, here are the notes so that you can see them. And then the, the puzzle is, do you see four parts? I do not. I, I only see not. one part. Does that, nobody yeah. sees four parts, um, but there's your clue, augmentation and diminution. Um, and so uh, people try to figure this out, and it is fairly complicated. So one person is supposed to play the top part. Another part, you augment it, you slow it down by a factor of two. You invert and then you transpose. You have to figure out how much, right? Uh, and you get another part. The third part you have, to, uh, you have to augment again and transpose again, and the fourth part you have to augment yet again, invert and transpose, and uh, when you do all of that, if you take that top line, make all of these uh, transformations, what you get is... The, the original theme from the Goldberg Variations. Um, and so uh, this is what you heard at the top. So here again is the 14th canon.
<laughs> but do we have time for some questions? Oh, yeah. Excellent. Great. We can't actually see any of you, but I hope you have questions. <laughs> Over here. Hey, Pop. Just shout, shout it out. We'll repeat it. Oh. Great question. Are there unique solutions to these? Um, uh, I'm not a musicologist. I looked into this a few years ago. Some of these are, are like the first couple are not particularly tricky. Like you just read it backwards. <laughs> There's not much else to do. Uh, there are several different uh, solutions to the last one, right? And so there are different ways to put it together. Uh, this is the sort of the commonly accepted one. We don't really know what Bach thought or which one he had in mind. Yeah. Of that plus um, also just comparing it with convention at the time or maybe what we know about other uh, pieces that have been written out I, I would love to put some uh, you know some AI onto this like yeah. would, would it come up with the same solutions like, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> any other questions Yeah, what, is, what does research on this sort of thing look like? I think there's a lot of different ways you can approach things mm -hmm. like this, including so from a historical perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some authentication that has to be done to figure out, uh, you know, is this really Bach? And, and they've gone through that. I think it was 76, if I have it right, when this was found in a, in a copy of the Goldberg mm -hmm. Variations. Um, I, think there's, I think you've seen some of the kinds of things that you can do in these other talks with music, right? And you could apply all of those tools to this as well, right? You can find patterns in Bach and then you could, you could actually do an interesting data science project. <laughs> like, could you authenticate this, not through sort of the history of the documents themselves, but like through patterns and whether or not this, this looked like Bach and had the same patterns as other Bach. So I think you could do a lot of that. Um, I, I don't know what other, you have any other ideas? Um, no, I mean, I think those are great answers. I think that there are probably many things that could be explored for sure. Yeah. Up front. In the transformation you referred to as reflection in the x-axis, how did you decide which horizontal line was the x-axis? That's a great question. Uh, there are a couple of things we really glossed over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you, can you, can, you can reflect over any place, and then you have to sort of decide, right? Um, the other thing you have that's tricky is you have to decide what you do with the accidentals. So if you have a sharp, right, so if it, 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 in one sense that should take you up. If you, if you reflect that, does that become a flat? Do you mm -hmm. maintain it, right? You have to make some choices in here. And, uh, and there's some artistic like, uh, license in here. You make, make choices that sound good rather than ones that sort of like literally stick to you know, like the mathematical reflection. Oh, oh, over somewhere. here, I think. Back here. like a great research question to me. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to try, we're going to not be able to repeat that uh, for, for the recording for others in the room, but yeah. a lot of great questions in here. I, I, I th there are some questions in yeah. here that, I, that are sort of very natural. Sure. I mean, some groups here are naturally come out of this. You can imagine, you know, you can imagine other group structures in here. You, you can, just the transformations, you can think of transformations or you can think of transformations mod octaves. So once you go up 12 half steps, then you're back to the beginning. That gives you additional group structures. 
instructors, you can start to ask questions like, which groups are musical? Like, which groups can you represent in a reasonable way in music? Um, I think there's another part of that question in there, like, how much of this, like, did Bach actually do group theory? Or, or you know, is it, how closely related to group theory was Bach? Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think we can know that. Um, I will say that, that when, you, when you dive into these details, when you look at what Bach wrote, all the beautiful canons, how they sort of magically fit together, um, I don't know that Bach was doing group theory, but he would have been a fantastic group theorist. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. Thank you.